So hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our safety webinar covering load securement, selecting and using tie downs and binders. Presenting today will be Henry Bergina, our corporate trainer for Columbus McKinnon. My name is Gisela Clark. I'm the e-marketing specialist at CM and will be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, there are just a few things we'd like to cover. And if Henry, you can change to the next slide, please. So just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, probably later today or early tomorrow, you'll receive an email with a copy or a link to the recording on our YouTube channel. At the very end of today's session, we'll allow five minutes for Q&A. You can type your questions during the meeting and then we will ask them at the very end. And last but not least, uh, the best question that's asked today, we will turn into a blog post. So uh, that will follow next week on our blog or, or the following week. So please ask good questions. So at this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Henry so that he can begin. Henry? Good morning, everyone. Uh, like Gisela said, I, you know, I, my name is Henry Bergina. I'd like to thank her for going ahead and arranging all this because uh, I am kind of on a remote site for, with this. But some of the things that we'll cover today or we'll talk about today is going to be the identification and proper use of various tie downs and binders. Uh, reviewing the forces that affect the use of these binders is obviously you want to make sure that you have a proper binder to, to make sure that your load does not uh, shift or move on your uh, on your vehicle. All right, how to properly inspect load securement equipment. This is probably one of the areas where some uh, people kind of fall short. They don't realize that they may actually be working with something that's substandard because they, they really have not been trained or taught what is a substandard product. And hopefully uh, after today we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have given you the idea of what is something that you should be looking for. And then of course we'll talk about the different grades of chain that are out there. Uh, that can be used for load securement. Uh, in, in contrast, uh, there is no grades for synthetics as far as uh, the straps go. Uh, like chains, you have grades, different grades of chain. Uh, you do not have that with, uh, with straps. It's uh, basically it's whatever the working load limit is and uh, you can use it. So obviously we, uh, the information in this training is intended for general purposes only. The information is not a substitute for review of the applicable uh, government regulations and standards. Uh, please review those, and those are sometimes they're state specific and even municipality specific. So, anytime you have something on a truck and you're going through a different area, you may want to research and find out what those standards are for that particular area because they will vary. All right, and the standards that we're going to talk about are the FMCSA standards. Uh, which are the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Uh, they do uh, use the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance uh, documentation as well. Uh, so you're going to have to be versed in at least both of those. All right. So obviously the purpose of this is to promote safety. We want to make sure that we uh, prevent any kind of accidents, uh, especially a, a very bad accident, a fatality of some kind. Uh, that's definitely not going to be a good thing. So. We'll talk about the safe use and care. All right. First thing you want to do is, is you have to be realized that there are going to be different forces that are going to act on your loads. Uh, some of these forces, even though the load may only weigh, say, 20,000 pounds, because it is traveling at a high rate of speed going down a highway at, say, 55 or 65 miles an hour or even 75 miles an hour, uh, and you hit the brake, uh, that force just multiplied. All right. And if you do not have uh, sufficient tie downs on that load to keep it from moving, it will move. All right, so there are diff understanding those forces is very, very important. And this is what I'm talking about here. You've got a, 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 a an accident that happened. The driver had a basically a, a granite block in the back of this trailer. He hit the brake, and the, obviously the granite block was not uh, restrained inside this container and it basically blew out the front end of the container and hit the cab. All right, this is, believe it or not, this is somewhat of a typical accident that happens out there every day. Uh, a lot of drivers uh, don't understand that, you know what, I got to make sure I have sufficient tie down to hold this load down in case of an accident, or not necessarily an accident, but uh, an emergency maneuver. Uh, somebody cuts you off on the road, 
Uh, I'm not talking about the driver running into the guardrail or running into a bridge abutment or hitting another vehicle. It's more the 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 driver that cuts the uh, truck off and the truck driver hits the brake. Now all that load is that load is still moving in the forward direction. The truck is trying to stop, and your your tie downs need to restrain that load from going forward. All right. So, what do you need for cargo requirements? All right. There's equipment methods different types of ways to hold down loads must be strong enough to withstand the lateral forces like I just said a few minutes ago. All right, there's different types of things that you can have out there that are on trailers within trucks that are there by the manufacturer so that you can attach to them. You've got things like D-rings, you've got anchor points like the logistic rail, you've got other rings that are actually bolted to either the floor or the deck of the truck or could actually be de uh, bolted to the side panels of an, in of an interior of a truck. These are all there for you to use as uh, anchor points. All right, you, the cargo could also be placed up against the headboard or the bulkhead of the truck. Stakes, uh, like say for example a, a log carrier, they'll have stakes uh, that will come up from the trailer itself. Uh, there's also stakes on a flatbed trailer where you'll see the stake pockets. They're usually somewhere in the neighborhood of two by four. They're, they're there to actually restrain the load. That's what they're there for. That's what you want to use them for. All right. One of the things, or actually several of the things that you want to take into account uh, is for when you're using the equipment and the methods must, uh, must meet the applicable standards. Some things to consider are you have to consider the size of the load. You have to consider the shape of the load as well as the strength of your tie-down equipment. What are the characteristics of load? It kind of goes along with the shape of the load. Uh, we're not always putting nice symmetrical shaped loads on trucks. Uh, they're, sometimes they're different. Uh, they might be heavy on one end, light on the other end. They may be very, very tall or they may be very, very short. Uh, those are things that you want to consider when you're doing when you're placing a load on a truck and the tie downs that you're going to use to hold that load down. Uh, some of the tie downs that are out there that you want to use are basically lever tools. You've got chains, you've got grab hooks, binders, wenches, the blocking, and I'm talking about using hardwood blocking uh, that can be nailed to the to the, the to the deck of the trailer uh, to restrain the load from rolling. Usually that you'll see a lot of that will happen with uh, round loads, hauling paper rolls or some kind of a, a round load barrels. They'll uh, nail some a two by four down to the uh, to the deck of the floor. And now that I'm speaking about blocking, is what you do want to use is you have to use something that is a hardwood. You can't uh, it cannot have any damage done to it. Cannot have any knots. Uh, so that's very important when it comes to blocking. The uh, reason why you can't have anything like that, uh, you know, the knots or any damage done to it is it's not going to be 100%. Uh, there's a chance because it's now that it's got a, a defect in it or a flaw in it, it can let the load go and then now you have an unrestrained load. All right, uh, bracing. Again, it could be blocking, uh, it could be 2 by 4s it could be something else, but it needs to be able to withstand some of those lateral forces. Uh, we can use shackles to make chains longer, uh, to, to attach to different products. Uh, I'm sure some of you have used shackles to attach to, say, some kind of like a front end loader. Because the, some, sometimes the front end loaders, the manufacturer will put eyes in certain parts of the body. You can put a shackle in there and attach the hook to the shackle and then attach the hook e via, either via chain or a shack, or a, I'm sorry, a binder of some kind, whether it be a ratchet binder or a lever binder, and then attach to the trailer itself. Stake pockets you can use to, you can use uh, chains to go through the stake pockets and attach the hooks. Uh, D rings D rings are usually attached to the trailers, either they're bolted on place or they're welded. Primarily, the ones a lot of the ones that I've seen mostly are are uh, welded to trailers. Uh, the pockets themselves, uh, the stake pockets are usually outside the rub rails these might actually be inside the rub rails. Uh, ratchet straps themselves, uh, tie downs, I'm talking about chain tie downs, uh, front end of the structure, the bulkhead or the uh, headboard uh, of the trailer. You can push the load up against that, that will restrain the load 
a lot of times from moving forward. Synthetic straps, uh, they have to be looked at, all right? Synthetics, um, there are different types of synthetics. There's polyester, there's nylon, uh, there's round, there's high performance, uh, and that field is growing. Uh, there are more uh, straps out there that are starting to come into the market that are made of somewhat exotic materials, uh, but they're far and few between right now because they, are, they, they, they do tend to be on the expensive side. All right. Again, the equipment's got to be uh, able to meet standards. Uh, some of the things that you got to consider again are size, shape, strength, and the characteristics of not just the load, but of the straps themselves. All right, they are light. They're easy to use. All right, they're fairly inexpensive. They do reduce load damage because they are somewhat they are softer. So you'll see a lot of a lot of the drivers will put them around loads so that they don't uh, damage the load like uh, say wire rope or chain may. Uh, but flip side is is there are some cons to these. They, they are subject to cuts and abrasions and where some drivers fall a little short is they don't put an abrasion pad underneath the strap so as that truck is traveling down the road say you got a load of steel or not steel pipe but say uh, concrete pipe for example it's laying on the truck and you've got the strap going over the top of it it's holding down the load everything's all great the thing is you have to remember is as that truck travels down the road it's always bouncing and moving so the load is always bouncing and moving around as well the strap is above that load as the load is moving the strap isn't and that load is starting to abrade that strap and that's where uh, you have to put some kind of abrasion protection in there Otherwise, eventually it will cut through the strap. It may not do it on that particular load. It may do it on the next load or maybe the load after that, but it's going to compromise the strap. All right, synthetics are subject to chemicals and UV degradation. Uh, UV, yep, sunlight. Uh, these things are being used outside. Uh, they will deteriorate over time because of the sunlight. Uh, again, they're made of polyester nylon. It's kind of the same stuff that we make carpets out of. Uh, if you look at you know, a carpet in your house, uh, you move a piece of furniture and you notice that the carpet faded. Uh, yeah, it's faded to us. It's, well, it doesn't look very good, not a big deal. Well, the materials that we're making straps out of are pretty much the same thing. So they will deteriorate over time. Uh, when the strap starts losing color, that's usually an indication of uh, UV damage. Does that mean I'm telling you, no, you can't use synthetic straps to hold down loads? No, not at all. When you do use synthetic straps, all right, fine, you, you're all done. Advice is take the strap, put it away. Get it out of the sunlight. Don't leave it on the back of the trailer because all it's doing, even if it's not holding down anything, it's exposed to the sunlight, it's exposed to UV degradation, you're going to be you're going to start taking away life out of that strap. All right. The other thing is the straps can't be repaired. All right. When, once they're damaged, they're damaged. Uh, there are certain criteria where they will allow a certain amount of damage on a strap. Most manufacturers that I have spoken to uh, will not allow any damage to the straps whatsoever. Uh, once a strap has been compromised, it should be taken out of service and replaced. All right. So then the other tie downs that we use out there are chain, okay? They are flexible, they are impact resistant, they're made of steel, okay? So we can kind of toss them around, they'll take, they'll take a beating. Mm -hmm. They are easy to inspect and what I mean by that is, is everything's exposed. Uh, on synthetics, the problem you have with synthetics is there's literally in some cases thousands of pieces of thread that hold these, uh, or yarn that hold these synthetics that make up the strap. Well, over time, I can't see the inside. I can't open it up. I can't look at it. So I can't really do a really good inspection on those. So I got to kind of uh, trust my instincts as to how long I've been using this, where I've been using it, and what it looks like All right, to determine whether or not it's still a good piece of material to use for tie downs. Chain, on the other hand, I, everything's out in the open. I can look at every single link. I can inspect it 100%. All right, uh, can, it is completely repairable. Uh, chain, if you have a bad link in there, uh, say you were hauling a load and you inadvertently nicked one of the links with something, uh, I don't care what, you name it, 
it got nicked, it's got a little nick in it, uh, you now you're like, well, now I got a, a 20 foot piece of chain I can't use because it's damaged. No, you can take it to a repair shop uh, and you, they can actually cut that link out and they can repair it. All right, there is minimal elongation on the links themselves. Uh, the corrosion resistance, uh, for most tie downs, you're going to be using grade 70 chain. Uh, and it will have a gold chromate finish on it. Why do we make it gold chromate? It's resistant to a lot of different types of uh, weather, salt especially. Uh, you come up into the northern states, there's a lot of states that still put rock salt on the roads to get rid of snow and ice. That rock salt will find its way, as far as liquid anyway, will find its way up into your tie downs and over time it will corrode them. So we put a gold chromate finish on them to slow that down, so we'll slow that process. Are you going to ever prevent it? Mm, probably not, but it will it will slow it down dramatically. And then of course they are very, very durable again. They're made of steel. You can they they, they can take a beating and still keep and still keep moving. All right. Uh, again, like I said previously, chains are graded. There's different levels for them. The higher the grade level, the the, the better the chain is as far as strength and quality goes. There are various grade levels. There's grade 43, 70, 80, and 100 are pretty much the dominant ones. There is a grade 30 as well. Uh, but grade 70, 80, and 100 are usually the ones that most people are using, um, uh, especially in the trucking industry. 80 and 100 are rated for overhead lifting. Grade uh, 70 is not. All right. Reason being is grade 80, grade 100 have to have some alloy properties to them so that they can elongate so the operators can see that something's wrong. Grade 70 does not have that kind of alloy type of uh, ability to stretch or, or elongate uh, very much before it breaks. All right, so looking at the grade designation on the chain links themselves is very, very important. I've told people in my classes when I do a class is if you pick up a piece of chain and you cannot find the grade level on there, uh, you should take it out of service because chances are it's it's worn off and that chain is is it shouldn't be used. Mm -hmm. All right, in the uh, DOT, if they pull you over and they cannot find a grade level, they will automatically assume it is a grade 30. And unfortunately, in some cases, they will pull you and take you out of service because you don't have enough tie downs. Even though you can swear that that chain is grade 70 or grade 80, which has a higher working load limit and stronger than grade 30, uh, that DOT enforcement officer, he's not, he doesn't care. He's just going to tell you, I don't see a grade on there. It's grade 30 to me. And he'll take you out of service. Henry, I have a question. Have... If the grade is no longer on the chain, but you know for a fact that it is a certain grade, what do you do next so that you don't run into that issue? Uh, if you have, uh, if if you know it's a grade 80 chain and all the markings are worn off, I would take it out of service. Either that, or you can still continue to use it, but it but you're going to have to use it as a, at a reduced working load limit, and that reduced working load limit is going to be equal to grade 30 because that's what the DOT officer will do. So it automatically downgrade, downgrades it to a 30, so they would really need correct. to replace it. Okay, thank That is you. correct. All right, <clears throat> so like I said, grade 80, grade 100, they are alloy uh, steel chains. Uh, they're approved for overhead lifting. Uh, grade 70 is not, and that is the one that is primarily used uh, in, the, in the transportation industry. Uh, there is also a T80 and a T100 chain uh, and components, and that is a transportation chain as well. That can be used for uh, transportation tie downs. Uh, do not think that T80, T100 can be used for overlifting. It is not. That is not the case. All right. So make sure that if you are using T80, T100, they are for tie downs only. Grade 70 is for tie down purposes as well. Grade 30, grade 43 as well, you can use for tie downs, but again, they have much lower working load limits, so you may end up having to put down uh, maybe twice as many grade 30 uh, tie downs on a, on a load versus, say, using grade 70 or grade 80. Uh, you may only have to do half of the tie downs because you'll have enough working load limit on them to restrain the load. So again, make sure you look at the markings on the chains. Very, very important. 
It'll also tell you some of the markings that you'll also see on there are going to be the manufacturer uh, who made the chain. All right, whether it was CM or, or company XYZ, those markings will be there as well. There will also be a trace code on that chain as well. To you, it doesn't mean anything, but to us in the uh, manufacturing industry, it does. It tells us who, when, and where, and what machine at that type that chain actually was produced from. So, in the event of some kind of an investigation, uh, we can we can find out what's going on. It'll tell us what the chemical composition is of that chain. Uh, where where our vendor got it from, what he put into it. So if there's any issues, uh, it will that trace code will tell us. So again, the markings on the chain very very important. All right, again, grade 30 can be used for tie downs. Uh, this is the stuff that when you walk into your local hardware store and you see those barrels of, of chains sitting on the floor, and it's uh, they're for sale and they got a nice shiny color to them. That's the grade 30 chain. Uh, it's a very low cost chain. Uh, it is proof coil, which means it's tested to what its, wor its working load limit is, and that's it. All right, so grade 30 is very, very low grade of chain. Grade 70, obviously a much, much better grade of chain. This is what is predominantly used in the industry for uh, load securement, and you can see from the slide, it says CM USA, and then it has G70 on the bottom. Those are the markings that you're looking for. All right. These are some uh, connectors that people have used in the past. Uh, these are not good uh, connectors. All right, these are very low carbon connectors. These, not, these are not acceptable for uh, load securement at all. Uh, if a DOT officer pulls, pulls you over and sees these type of connectors, again, he'll take you out of service. All right. Uh, chain inspection. When we're doing an inspection, um, look at the links carefully. Not just you know grab grab the chain and look at it in your hand. Take and you know separate some of the links. Make sure that they're not worn out. Uh, you have to remember that every single one of those links is articulating, and wherever those links are touching, they're wearing themselves out. All right, so that that needs to be looked at. Henry, before yes. we go into the next session, I'd like to just launch a quick polling slide, okay? Sure. So this question is, when using a Columbus McKinnon gold colored chain, what markings will be visible on the chain? Is it G7, G70, CG7, or P70? Again, when using CM gold colored chain, what markings will be visible on the chain? And sorry, this is a load chain. Yeah, um, G7, G70, CG7, or P70. Wow, looks like you've uh, <laughs> done a good job covering it. Looks like we're kind of, looks like about 90% say G70, and the other two are split between G7 and CG7. So Henry, go ahead and share please what the answer is. It is G70. Uh, for Columbus McKinnon chain, uh, there are some companies that will put G7 on there. So the people that did say G7, uh, to a certain extent, you are correct as well. Uh, the the P7, uh, I don't know of anybody that actually uses that. So if there's somebody out there that is that, that's something that I have I have not seen. All right, but all the manufacturers will use G7, G70. I've even seen some people actually use G07, uh, but needless to say, you'll see that 70 mark on there somewhere. Okay. So uh, yes, I'm glad to see that 90% uh, of people got it. Got got the well, actually, probably a little bit more than 90%, but good. Yeah, thank you. All right. So whenever we're doing an inspection on on, on our load chain uh, for for transportation, you're look. What, these are some of the things you're looking for. Uh, like the third picture shows interlink wear. If you collapse the link, you'll be able to see where that interlink wear is. We're looking at stretched links. Uh, chain chain will stretch to a certain extent, obviously before it breaks. Uh, when you start seeing the chain not articulating very well, and what I mean by that is, if you pick up a, 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 a section of chain and actually let it fall down into your hand, it pretty much piles up really, really nicely and easily. Uh, if you take that same pile and you had the link stretched, 
uh, that li those links, when they pile up, they kind of almost have to get forced into that pile because they don't articulate very well. That's usually an indication of, that you have some stretched links. Uh, bends or twists in the links, uh, those are going to show up rather quickly. You'll see those easily. Uh, any damage done to them from heat. Uh, now, some people might say, well, you know, we don't see a lot of heat damage on, on, on transportation chain. And, and that's probably true because there's not a lot of high heat sources that, that can damage chain uh, on a truck. But you know what? If somebody's uh, using a welder on the truck, they're maybe fixing a component on the trailer, uh, and they happen to damage the chain, you know, whether they might have heated it up or they might have got some welt spatter on it. Welt spatter is usually the big thing when it comes to the chain. Uh, you see welt spatter on it, you got to take it out of search because that link has been compromised. All right, and in, the, and in the case of transportation chain, that link can be removed and repaired. All right, a new one put in. So those are things that people need to understand. Uh, chain, chain is not chain. It doesn't last forever. You do have to look at it every once in a while and make sure it's okay. All right, synthetics. Uh, when we get into synthetic straps, uh, again, like I said, they're somewhat very uh, economical to use because they're not that expensive. Uh, they're easy, they're comfortable, they don't damage the load if they're tightened down too much, uh, but they are susceptible to damage easily, a lot more easily than, say, wire rope or chain is. Uh, you're going to see cuts in them, you're going to see chemical damage, uh, knots. Knots are not something that you want to see in any kind of a strap. Uh, I mean, you see any of this damage, take it out of service. It, it's, it's just an, it's an accident waiting to happen. And if a DOT officer sees you, he'll, he'll probably take you out of service for that as well. All right. Other damage that you'll see, or this, uh, this slide here shows uh, uh, what I got here. I got two, four, six, eight. I got nine representations of, of damage that has been done to different types of slings. The one that uh, I think is very, very important is that last one on the right there, worn tag or missing tag. Uh, there's all too often um, straps. Uh, because they're hanging out in the air, they're susceptible to rain, snow, and ice, the warning tags on them tend to deteriorate rather quickly. Those have to be there. The officer, when he stops you and he looks at that tag, he has to be able to read it. All right, that tag takes the place of the uh, G70 uh, markings that are on chains. All right, all those embossings, whether it's G70, G80, or G100, those markings have to be there. Uh, this on, on our synthetics, we have to have our our tag, and we have to have not only have the tag, but we got to be able to read it. If it's there and I can't read it, it does me no good. All right. The other thing that is uh, this is something that's fairly new is dust and dirt. All right. Obviously, because these are outside, they're going to get dusty. They're going to get dirty. What is what we're finding out now is that dust and dirt is detrimental to synthetic straps. All right. Uh, what's happening is the dust and dirt is getting inside the straps, and as that strap is used over time, that dust and dirt, because they're, yes, they're somewhat microscopic, mm -hmm. uh, but they're actually starting to wear away on the inside of that strap. And what's happening is, is the fibers on the inside are starting to break down, and unfortunately, we can't see those. So the idea here is to try and keep them as clean as possible, uh, keep them closed up, put them in a utility box. Uh, it does a couple of things. It keeps the dust and dirt from getting on them, keeps them cleaner, but not only that, but it takes them out of the sunlight, so you're also helping to prevent UV degradation as well. All right, and then again, cuts. If you got cuts on them, uh, I would, uh, if they can be repaired, get them repaired, uh, or take them out of service and get new ones put in. All right, because now that it's been compromised, uh, I have no idea what it can hold now. Uh, maybe at one time it was good for 10,000 pounds. Now it's got a cut in it. Can it hold 10,000 pounds? I haven't a clue. All right, that, that working load limit has now been changed. Hooks, you want to look at your hooks. Uh, make sure they're not damaged. Uh, look at the eye. Make sure the eye's not worn out. Uh, it's not elongated. Same thing with the hook opening itself. Make sure it's, um, it's, it's nice and... Uh, what it's supposed to be, it's it's not opened up, uh, and most of the manufacturers, actually not most, all of the manufacturers will tell you what that hook opening is. In this case, that G dimension, they will tell you what that is. 
Uh, you can go to any of their websites and type and go look at their hooks and look at the, uh, the the listing for all of the information on that hook. They'll tell you exactly what that is. They, this is not a deep dark secret. This they, they want you to have this information. They want you to look at these hooks so that you can take them out of service when that dimension gets too big. All right. You see a hook something like this, bent and twisted. Uh, my advice is don't use it. You've gone. Some people would say, well, I can heat that up and uh, bend it back. And it's like, well, you could, but now all you have is a nice little paperweight. Uh, because what you've done is by heating it up, we heat these hooks up in a furnace and then we quench them in a fluid to give them strength so that people can use them out in the field. And we know that what that process is and we can control that. When you go out and you heat that up and bend it back straight, you've re started to reverse that process. Now we cannot guarantee that that hook will, say, uh, have a working load then was something like, say, 5,000 pounds if that was its original. Because, of, because you heated it up, you reversed that process, I have no idea what it can pick up. All right, so you've gone, once you do something like that, you've got to take it out of service. Hey, Henry, really Shackle. quick, you've got about 10 minutes before we open it up for questions, okay? Okay. Uh, shackles, same thing. Uh, look for wear on the shackles. Uh, make sure that they're not pitted. Uh, make sure that all the components are there. Make sure the, the uh, embossing on the shackles are legible. All right, they need to be legible. We need to be able to read these. Uh, again, don't tie chains and knots. If it's too long, get chain shorteners or shorten up the chain via the, uh, the, the tie down or the, uh, the binder itself, whether it be a lever binder or a ratchet binder. The proper way to install hooks on a load, uh, obviously the slide on, on the right is the wrong way. You don't want to do that. That's a tip load. You're actually loading the weakest part of the hook. That hook is subject to failure. All right, lever binders, there's a lot of different types of lever binders. All of these meet DOT specs as well as the CVSA requirements. Uh, lever binders, they're nice because they do articulate, uh, the hooks do articulate 360 degrees. Uh, they are proof tested as well. All right, there is a hole in the handle to facilitate holding it down once it is in a locked position. Uh, they have you have to make sure that that handle cannot come free because again the truck is bouncing down the road there's a possibility that might break free all right uh, ratchet binders uh, those are nice because they will allow you to uh, put load on the ratchet in a somewhat controlled manner and actually re 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 release the load in a controlled manner as well where a lever binder it's either tight or it's loose uh, ratchet binders are a little bit, a little bit in between. All right, direct tie downs. Uh, we're tying down a load. That means that one end of the, the chain or the tie down is actually attached to the load, versus going around the load, which is an end rack, which will be coming up, will be coming up in just a couple of minutes. All right, we're going to increase the problem with direct tie downs. Is you could actually have four of them and all of them will be, you don't want to get them all real, real tight because there's one might be actually a little bit looser than the others, so you got to kind of go from one end to the other. This is an example of a direct tie down. All right, uh, direct tie downs, again, using grade 70 chain at least, I would recommend. Uh, high tensile steel, uh, indirect tie downs don't attach directly to the load. They basically go around the load. I like to tell people the difference between the two is the difference between a handshake and a bear hug. Uh, an indirect tie down is a bear hug, uh, direct tie down is a handshake. All right, it will create a force, on, a downward force on that particular load and into the, the the truck itself. They they must be kept tight to do their job. All right, otherwise the load will shift. All right, they don't lose or gain tension when the load tries to move. All right. Indirect tie downs, this is an example of indirect tie downs. You can see how the straps are going over the top of these pipes. Some of the things that you have to remember about indirect tie downs is as that angle of the tie down changes, if we have a more vertical tie down, uh, it's basically coming over the top of the load and then straight down to the trailer, we're going we're gonna to be actually somewhere around 100% of our working load limit is there. As that tie down goes away from the load, like it shows in the slide here, we start losing tension. 
Uh, and some of you may even experience this uh, inadvertently when you're putting a load down on a, on a truck and it's like, wow, this thing's not really, this is what's happening. Is, is as that angle starts going out and we're starting to approach like 15 degrees, uh, we've lost a lot of our working load limit. And you can see just on this chart alone is as that angle changes, how much force we're actually losing. And this is one reason why you'll end up putting even more tie downs actually on a smaller load simply because it's in the middle of the trailer and it's somewhat of a narrow load and it, our tie downs are going out at a very, very low angle of say 15 degrees. All right. All right. So tie downs can be used in two ways, attached to the cargo or it can be passed over the cargo. All right. When you do use tie downs, make sure that if you have the load above the trailer, it's sitting on some kind of cribbing, 4 by 4s or 2 by 4s or whatever, uh, make sure that you have the tie downs going over or at least above the cribbing. Otherwise, you'll end up with something like this. If you put the tie downs in the middle, you're actually going to start to bend the load and if the load is not strong enough to absorb that, it will potentially break or bend. Uh, needless to say, your your customer is not going to be happy when you deliver this. No. All right. So if we have working load limits. Uh, some of you have, may have heard something called aggregate working load limit. It does not mean that we have a load of stone on the back of our truck. It is actually a word that they use to figure out how many tie downs we need for a particular load. So what we want to do is we want to add together 100% of the working load limit of each end section of the tie down that is attached to an anchor point, 50% of the working load of each end section that is attached to the cargo. So here's an example of what we're talking about. All right, if I go to the next page, here's what we're looking at. All right, so in this case we have four different tie downs. They're good for 5,000 pounds a piece. All right, we're going to add those all together. It's going to give us 20,000 pounds. All right, in this example, to secure a load that weighs 40,000 pounds, it would require four tie downs with a working load limit of at least 5,000 pounds each to secure this load. All right, now this is keeping in mind the load is only five feet long. If the load gets longer, we need more tie downs. All right, anything over five feet, we need to add an additional tie down. Anything over 10 feet, and when I say 10 feet, it's 10 feet one inch, 10 feet quarter inch, that's over 10 feet, you need to put another tie down on it. I, I know some cases, some people might say, well, that's kind of silly, but that's the way the law reads, uh, unfortunately. All right, so what does the driver have to do? He has to make sure that cargo is properly distributed and adequately secured in accordance with our standards, okay? Make sure that all securement equipment and the vehicle structures are in good working order and are used consistent with their capabilities. So we don't want to go out and, and uh, use a piece of chain to hold down the load uh, and then all of a sudden we find out the chain's too long, we're going to tighten the knot. It's like, no, we don't do that. So we want to make sure that we use the components that we have along with the way they were designed to be used. Stow the vehicle equipment when you're not using it, all right, especially synthetic straps. You don't want to leave them out exposed to the sun because the, we're, we're concerned with UV degradation. Make sure that nothing obscures the front and side uh, view mirrors of your, uh, your truck. All right. Inform the carrier if the packaging is not adequate. Right? If there's something loose on it, the banding is not quite right, don't take the load. I mean, I understand if you've got broken pallets uh, because as soon as you put it on your truck, you're responsible for that. All right. So if you deliver it and that person getting it says, well, that pallet's broken, the load has been compromised, and you're going to look at him and tell him, well, that's the way they put it on the truck. He's not going to believe you. Trust me. You're going to be responsible for it. All right, so periodic inspections during transit, inspect the cargo and securing devices, adjust the cargo or adjust the uh, load securement devices as necessary. All right, that is pretty much the definition of a load securement device is it has to be able to be adjusted during the load or, or readjusted all right, during the trip uh, as necessary. These are the things that drivers are, are responsible for. You can see that first one is inspect the cargo and the securing devices all across the board. Those are his responsibilities in a nutshell. All right, inform the carrier if packaging is not adequate. That's the driver's responsibility prior to it getting put on his truck. 
adjust the cargo and or securing devices as necessary throughout the trip. All right, add additional securing devices. Again, as necessary. All right, that is pretty much the definition of, of cargo securement devices. We can add them as necessary. Some people like to think that um, uh, the black banding that they use, whether it's the half inch, one inch, whatever banding that they put on there that we could use that for cargo securement. Well, it sounds like a good idea, but unfortunately you can't because you can't adjust it. You can't add more to it if you need it. All right, it is a, it's a fixed way of uh, uh, putting a load on a skid, yes, but not on a trailer, not on a truck. All right, you could go to our website. This is one of the websites that we have out there that can help you. It's, again, it's, it's, it's more of a guidance tool than it is a, uh, 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 something that you could actually define uh, how, to, how to secure loads, but it is more, more uh, as guidance than it is anything else, so please use it carefully. Uh, review the FMCSA uh, regulations, uh, and then, of course, review the cargo standards uh, for the state and country in which you are operating in. That is probably the biggest thing that I could recommend that you do, because we've got different states. Different states have different rules for different types of loads. All right. Any questions? Excellent, Henry. Thank you very much. Um, on this call, we also have Troy Rains, who I believe your title, Troy, is our engineering manager. Um, he wanted to add something else about uh, load shifting creating momentum. Troy, are you on? I just kind of wanted to mention, you know, Henry touched on the characteristics of load. Any you know, size and shape and, and weight distribution is a big deal. I also wanted to um, find everyone that the, the whether it's a, a liquid or a solid can be a characteristic of the load, and the unbaffled liquid loads could shift within their container, requiring um, more load securement than you might think. That is that is very true. Thank you, Troy. Excellent. So please let us know what questions you have. I have another quick polling question, just to kind of uh, review something that Henry just covered. This has been a big education for me. I don't think I'm going to look at things the same way anymore uh, on the highway and uh, load securement. So how often is the driver expected to stop to inspect his cargo and the securement devices? Is it um, 100 miles, one hour, 150 miles, an hour, 200 miles or two hours, or 150 miles over three hours? So... Let's see. It looks like it's uh, everybody's voting kind of across the board, Henry. Let's give it another couple minutes or another couple seconds. All right. We're at about 25% uh, for the first answer, 10% for the second answer, about roughly 20% for the third answer, and about 40% for the last answer. So it's a good thing we covered this question. Can you share the answer to this? Sure. I got I got the slide up on here right now. It's at three hour intervals every hundred and fifty miles. Three hour interviews. <laughs> yeah, Ryan said, Oh, it's a trick question. I would have to agree with you there, but it's a good point to reinforce. That's excellent. Thank I mean, can the can the driver stop more often? Sure. You know, it's 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 up to the driver there, but per the standards, he has to stop a minimum of 150 miles or at three hour intervals, whichever one comes first. Excellent, thank you for that. Okay, um, what other questions do you have? We'd love to hear them. Uh, I know I have another one here. So let's see, um, Henry, what is the minimum number of attachment points required to secure a piece of heavy equipment? Five, <clears throat> well, let me rephrase it. It's gonna be at least four, all right, you have to have one basically for each corner, and most of the manufacturers of heavy equipment usually put some kind of an eye there. The fifth one, when I said that, is usually for any attachment to the heavy equipment. So, for example, if you've got a uh, excavator tool with a tracked excavator, the excavator itself needs four attachment points, and the bucket on the end needs at least one. So that would be five attachment points. And if you've got a, uh, a backhoe where you've got a shovel in front and a, and a hoe on the back end, uh, that one would actually need six because you would have four for the, for the machine itself, one for the shovel up front, and one for the bucket in the back. 
Excellent. Troy, would you like to add to that? I'm sorry, I had, just, I had just posted a quick thing. Let's go back to this uh, other question. So grade 80 and grade 100 alloy lifting chain is rated at a five to one design factor for overhead lifting. Does the working load limit or do design factors change when using these grades of change for tie downs? It's actually a four to one, Isla, and uh, no, it does not change. Okay, so yeah, he got it. Okay, so actually, the alloy lifting chain is rated at a four to one design factor, and it does not change. Okay, thank you for the question. We appreciate it, uh, Sam. And uh, let's see. And uh, Troy, I believe you wanted to share something as well. I just wanted to mention that the uh, CM load binders have the highest domestic content of any binder out there. Many of our binders are 100% domestic content, and a few of them have a bolt that may or may not be domestic. I can't prove where a bolt comes from sometimes, but every other component in our um, GM ratchet and lever binders is U.S. made here in Chattanooga. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Troy. Um, okay, I guess, uh, Henry, if you can go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Uh, to, the, to the website? Uh, no, keep, to the end. Keep, uh, to the end, to the training slide, quick. I know we're we're just out of time. I just wanted to cover really quick um, a couple of the training classes we have coming up in case any of you are interested. You can take a quick look. All of these classes can be found on our cmcodepot.com website. Uh, we have our rigging gear inspection class coming up in Charlotte. And we have um, chain and wire rope hoist certification, some others that you can read. Um, and then also we have a new online chain hoist repair recertification and also online overhead crane and hoist inspection recertification. So I just wanted to let you know about some of the classes. And of course, uh, we do have a load securement class that Henry teaches and it's, it's listed on our on our site. However, it's really by uh, request only. So if you have a group that you'd like to get trained, you just let us know and then Henry can arrange the training. We tried scheduling them at different times, but it seems like it's better if we, uh, if we just do it with, uh, with the requests that come in for that class. So now you can advance to the final slide, please, Henry. And so I just wanted to thank everyone for coming today and let you know how you can connect with us beyond today. As I said, we will be sending you a link to the recording once it's complete. And uh, we're also going to include a blog post that Henry wrote about chain grades. It is one of our top three most popular blog posts ever, ever written, which is uh, great. I think it has good information that might help. Um, but we're very active on social media. So if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, connect with us there. All these icons are located on the top right of our website, cmworks.com. You can, it'll take you directly to those uh, social media places. We also do have a blog where uh, we have over, I think today we've hit 200 articles on there covering a whole different variety of educational topics that might help you. So check that out as well. And uh, again, thank you all for coming. If you have any further questions, please send them to us um, after you receive the recording link and I'll forward them to Henry and he can answer them at that time. So again, thank you for joining us and we wish you a, a nice uh, rest of the morning or, or afternoon. And we appreciate the, the kind words that people have shared um, here in the comments. Thank you, bye-bye.